Hey everyone, before we start this episode, I wanted to talk to you about the situation in Maui. The destruction on Maui is considered the worst wildfire in modern U.S. history, with the death toll increasing hourly and over $5 billion in damage. The Maui fires have the attention of the international news cycle. However, this will continue to impact the people of Maui for years longer than one news cycle. On top of devastation and displacement, corporate interests have already begun trying to grab their scorched land to develop and profit off of the tragedy. Financially supported communities are better positioned to refuse land grab offers, so the more money we give the people of Maui in this crucial time, the better they can provide relief, rebuild, and ensure their land stays theirs for the long haul. The fastest way to spread the word right now is to make videos, communicate what you can in the, any way you can, whether it be on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube Shorts, and Twitter, encouraging people to donate. So the best place to donate is a, is a donation fund or, or run by Ina Mamona, a local grassroots nonprofit organization run by Native Hawaiians. The donations made here will go directly to verified Maui families impacted by the wildfires. So I'm going to put the link in the show notes. If you can donate, if you have the ability to do so, and you want to help the people directly, you can go and donate to the link below for NMOA. Like I said before, it's a local grassroots nonprofit organization run by Native Hawaiians. Thank you for your support in advance. I really appreciate it. I'm going to be putting this piece, this clip in all of my episodes for the next few weeks. And it's just something that we need to do to help people. We've seen the wrath of climate change, and now it's time to help the people that are affected by the consequences. Thank you so much for your support. Let's start the show. The Baltic Sea is one of the youngest and smallest seas in the ocean. It's an offshoot of the North Sea, and it's surrounded by Sweden, Finland, Estonia, part of Russia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Poland, Germany, and Denmark. A lot of countries are involved in the health and oversight of this wonderful sea. It's a brackish sea, so it's you know there's a lot of freshwater inputs. It's not as salty as say the North Sea or the Atlantic, but it does get it does flush in from the North Sea, and so it gets a lot of Atlantic waters in there. Um, and so it's a very big interest to a lot of those countries, including Finland. And on today's episode, we're going to be hearing from the uh, John Newman Foundation CEO. Anna Marie. She is going to be talking to us about the foundation. She's going to be talking about the work that's done in the Baltic Sea and the eutrophication that has been happening for centuries and now that how the how Finland as well as other countries are working towards reducing that eutrophication through working with foresters, working with farmers, and so forth. And it's a really interesting episode. It's something that I don't normally get to cover because I don't know much about the Baltic Sea or I don't know many people in that area. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to about this. So let's get started with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. I am your host, Andrew Lewin, and this is the podcast where you find out what's happening in the ocean, how you can speak up for the ocean, and what you can do to live for a better ocean by taking action. In today's episode, it's an exciting one, although a lot of them are exciting to me. Uh, but this one's especially excited because we're going to be talking about the Baltic Sea, which I know virtually nothing about. I do know I know more about it now because we were able to have the John Nermanen Foundation CEO Anna Marie Arakoski Engart on the podcast to be able to talk about you know the heritage the culture around uh, around the, the uh, Baltic Sea the different countries that work that they work with in the foundation to be able to work to for a better Baltic Sea to restore the Baltic Sea to what it once was before eutrophication and and we talk a lot about working with the different stakeholders the farmers the foresters the pulp and paper mills and how they are working towards reducing the amount of phosphorus and, uh, and nitrogens, uh, nit nitrogen and ammonia that go into the water that, that sort of contribute to uh, eutrophication within the Baltic Sea. It's it's something that I think is really important because, you know, one, we don't get to talk about this area. Um, Anna Marie talks a lot about um, why it's important for them as, a, as Finnish people to be able to help with the Baltic Sea. 
But it's also great to be able to hear about so many organizations, so many projects, so many researchers working through not only the foundation and other means to restore to you know this this wonderful sea and such an important sea to the countries that surround it, especially Finland. So very excited to be presenting this interview. So here's the interview with the John Newman and Foundation's CEO, Anna Marie Arakowski Engart. Enjoy the interview and I will talk to you after. Hey, Anne-Marie, welcome to the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Are you ready to talk about the Baltic Sea? I'm really excited, finally, to be able to talk with you, Andrew, about the oceans and the Baltic Sea. I am super excited to this. This is uncharted territory for me. Uh, I have never had a guest on, one from Finland, uh, and two, to talk about the Baltic Sea. And this is going to be fun because I don't know much about the Baltic Sea. I feel like, you know, living in North America, we don't learn a lot about it. Um, it it's feels like it's really distant. Uh, we were just talking about before we uh, we press record, and I'm, I'm already getting, like, excited. <laughs> and butterflies. So this is really excited. Uh, it's really exciting for me. We're going to talk about the Baltic Sea. We're going to talk about the issues facing it. We're going to talk about the uh, the foundation that you work for, the John Nermanen Foundation, uh, just to give people an idea of the projects that you work on, what the goal is for the Baltic Sea, who lives there. We're going to get a whole description of it because I think it's really important. And I hope this is going to be like a first of, of many podcasts about the Baltic Sea in the future. So uh, this is quite exciting for me. But before we start all that stuff, uh, why don't you, Anne-Marie, why don't you just let the audience know who you are and what you do? Yes, I'm very happy to do that. Yeah, my name is Anna-Marie Arrakoski Engard. It's a, it's a very Finnish name with a uh, touch of a German. So I have a double name. Uh, now it's a German whom I was able to even bring to to Finland. Nice, <laughs> and <I> nice. Am, <laughs> nice touch. So um, I am the CEO of John Nurminen Foundation and have worked here in the foundation. Now it's my 10th year this year. And uh, my background actually before starting to kind of, not only kind of, but saving the sea and its stories, my background is in publishing. I worked in publishing both in Germany and, and in Finland before I took over the uh, lead of this foundation. That's amazing uh, to go from, you know, book publishing to, you know, a, a CEO and working with an organization that is, you know, primarily uh, environmental. How does one go get to that point have you always been interested in the environment uh were the books more environmental can you just kind of give us a, uh, some context here absolutely um well let's say I've, I've always been interested in nature and uh and i have um background in sailing just as a hobby i'm not a uh, any kind of a competitive okay. or not <laughs> i have never sailed around this <laughs> around the globe yeah. or something but here in finland as you know we have Oh, thousands of lakes and rivers and all that. Uh, so swimming and, and water as an element, it's always been played a big part, big role in my in my uh, free time. So sailing, uh, sailing, sailing was there. But yes, I was always interested in. I'm I'm a great reader. I'm, I have a PhD in in literature, obviously. So uh, reading and books have always played played also a big role, and I. I believe in uh, education. I believe also in in civilization and in the civilized manners and ways. But um, and and therefore, I also see that books and reading knowledge has a certain role for us in order to kind of really make this planet some, somehow a better place. But then, um, as the founder of this foundation, Johan Urminen, asked me if I would not be interested. Or in Finland, you would say, "Are you not interested in in taking over <laughs> the, <laughs> right. the, the foundation as an operative um, manager?" Uh, I kind of thought, "Yeah, why not?" Since then, it's not only through books and and uh, stories that you kind of. Uh, lead the way and, and, and try to uh, influence people and their thinking, but really in concrete projects, in uh, concretely rescuing and saving uh, one, uh, the smallest ocean in this world would be a great legacy to leave. So, and, and then still keep on books. We do publish books. Uh, so uh, 
it was a great challenge and and great opportunity to learn something new. Absolutely. And to, you know, to fill in as a role as big as a CEO. I mean, it's a, it's a huge leadership role. Um, there are a lot of a lot of our audience members that are thinking of starting, uh, you know, their own organization or working for an organization. There's there's many organizations out, and you see these some sometimes you see these roles pop up as a CEO. Um, what led you to taking that? It's it's a huge role. Did you ha- did you have experience working as a CEO or something at that level where you knew how to work? Um, you know, with that type of leadership role? I had been um, both in Germany as well as in Finland. I had been publishing director, meaning meaning that uh, you are responsible for uh, millions of of dollars and and, and, uh, loads of people and their, uh, not only their future, but also their well-being and uh, motivation, Mm -hmm. as well as thousands of th- stories, successful books and uh, films and all that, what comes from a, from a good story. So I had, but it's a division leading uh, role. And then I went, I was in, invited to, uh, to lead the uh, second largest Finnish bookstore chain, which was also wow. something like, do I really know this? Why should I do this? And my <laughs> right. book publishing friends all over the world were kind of, a, why, sh- why would you do that? And I was like, well, now I, lo- I know everything about substance. I know every, everything about uh, collaborating with authors and with editors and with press me- people and all that. And we have always the salespeople saying, what kind of cover sell and what sells at what time of the year? I want to know it myself. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> so I took that opportunity to learn what is selling of stories and leading again different kind of people and, and different kind of, uh, of a chain. So yes, I had experience uh, on uh, responsibility and on big big shoes, so to say. But yeah, CEO was, uh, this This was the first time on that, uh, on the top level, so to say. Yeah, uh, that's incredible. That's awesome. You know, I'm always interested in, in how people become CEOs, you know, with with the various backgrounds that they have. And obviously, you must have felt comfortable in the leadership qualities that you've already gained throughout, you know, your experience and, and so forth to, to lead you to, um, you know, this foundation, this John Nermanen Foundation. Can you tell us, you know, the mission of, of the John Nermanen Foundation? Our mission is uh, to save the Baltic Sea and its heritage for future generations. So, even in that mission already is kind of our holistic view of seeing the Baltic Sea as a as a whole. It's, it has its ecological state uh, where we keenly and very you know daily <laughs> daily on daily basis uh, work on improving its uh, ecological state. But it also has it has its history, its future, mm-hmm. the wonderful, very colorful uh, culture around around the Baltic Sea in, in these ver- various states. And that is also important to, not only to preserve, but also to kind of um, um, challenge and, and form for the future. We are mm-hmm. obviously here to leave something better behind, hopefully. Absolutely, absolutely. And especially like, um, I, you know, I'm looking at the, the geography of it and Finland, you know, is pretty much wrapped or wrapped itself around uh, the Baltic Sea. There's there's quite a long coastline there, um, and so that makes it uh, that makes it very very interesting in its in in that. Before we get into that description, because I'm going to ask you, you know, can you tell us just sort of like what the Baltic Sea is like? And you know, we talked a little bit about it before we recorded. Uh, can you just tell us how the, the 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 foundation works? You know, usually when I think of foundation, is this this body that um, has a certain amount of funds. And then it gives out funds to particular projects. Is that essentially how the foundation uh, works in this in this context? I'm happy that you asked that, Andrew, because there we are. There we differ from. You are right. Okay. Most foundations are indeed uh, funding things, as the name even says. <laughs> <laughs> we we are functional uh, foundation. So. Um, Obviously, fundraising is important for us. We work on mm-hmm. on um, on other people's money, so to say. So we yep. have to keep the promise we give. Uh, we have to really keep on that mission, and and do that. 
responsibility, uh, responsible. Um, but we do concrete projects. We have a, a set target. We have uh, we need they, our projects need to be concrete. They need mm-hmm. to be measurable. Uh, mm-hmm. They have to have a, a, a cost-effective uh, method and working way. And uh, they need to have an impact on the uh, state of the Baltic Sea. And gotcha. this, is, this is how we work. And we are independent. So what, whoever is funding us or whatever, they, they cannot influence the, uh, kind of what kind of projects we do or where we do the projects. Obviously, there are some discussions with the Finnish foreign ministry or others, since we have to work also, or we mostly work on uh, other nations' uh, water bodies, also in the Finnish ones. But um, so we inform our foreign ministry what kind of projects we are going to do or doing. Uh, but we are independent and um, very carefully uh, planning and setting up the projects and they are all based on the data done by the researchers around the Baltic Sea in the research centers and universities. And those um, are also the people basically who independently uh, Mm -hmm. are those who can see if our projects really delivered what we said they would, because they are measuring the state of the Baltic Sea, the water quality, yeah. and has there been any improvement or not. That's the way we, gotcha. how we work um, in the environmental areas. And in the cont- cultural section, we also work with the researchers. Obviously, the issues and problems are different kinds. Uh, we try to kind of um, find the way how to touch people who don't have any connection to water or to oceans or to Baltic Sea. What kind of stories, pictures, uh, events, music would be the thing mm-hmm. that they would understand that, yes, there, there is a, it is important that you can still swim in the sea, that we don't walk to Tallinn, uh, to Estonia, that we don't walk to Germany, <laughs> but right. we actually need ships. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's definitely, you know, as someone who lives in Canada, in, in central Canada, I live around the Great Lakes, so we do see those quite regularly. But, you know, there's a distance to the ocean. And there's always, you know, a bit of that you're fighting that disconnect to the ocean, um, even though it's all, you know, connected. Yeah. Um, and so the, the what some people don't realize is they still have an effect on the ocean. Yeah. Um, and it's all important to us. It's important to our environment. It's important to our climate. It's important to everything as we are, you know, these days really coming to realize if you haven't realized over the last 30, 40, 60 years, you know now that, <laughs> uh, you know, everything is connected in the, on this planet. Um, but it's important to connect people um, in doing that. And, and especially with, you know, a, a water body that's, primarily on your coastline as a country you want to feel that that pride you know and and so it's part of the culture of of the finnish people and it's and i think that's that's important are there campaigns or or do people in in finland take pride in the baltic sea like it being along a major part of their coastline do you see that pride in in the culture it's obviously much stronger on the uh, coastal areas of finland and on the big cities uh, in the coastline uh then on the on the lake areas in the uh, forest areas yep. of Finland but there is a pride of of uh, clean nature and obviously mm. also pride in in us having been able already to uh, take care of our rivers and lakes in the past 30 40 years when uh, some of some of our lakes were in a very bad condition due to the paper industry and we have been able to turn turn around the uh, destiny and, and also the quality mm-hmm. of those lakes. So yes, we can see that absolutely. And this is also something we kind of want to hear and see uh, in our neighbor con- neighboring countries. 
Yeah. And there are quite a few, you know, looking at the map, there are quite a few of neighboring countries, um, some that I'm sure are easier to work with than than others, as as in a, many others that that, you know, in many other situations that have, uh, you know, a lot of international boundaries that that fit along uh, along coastline. Um, and and uh, yeah, so I think, you know, that that's going to be that's obviously important when you when you look at how many um, sort of discharges or, or how many uh, industries work along those coastlines. It's always, um, you know, a difficult thing to, to manage. Um, do you, does, does the foundation work on building relationships with researchers as well um, as groups that are interested in, you know, making the Baltic Sea, like having a similar mission to the Baltic Sea in, in other countries? Absolutely. That's, that's the, that's our th- strength. And that's also gotcha. the only way of, uh, doing these uh, large scale projects around the around yeah. the Baltic Sea. So that's very important for us and very natural too. So we have been working, we have had loads of projects, uh, eight different projects in Russia before the um, uh, U- uh, war in Ukraine and right. also before the Russia took over Krim. Uh, so it mm-hmm. was before 2014. Uh, we can only say that Baltic Sea has been lucky in the way that we were in time uh, there, doing the reduction yeah. of the uh, of the phosphorus in the municipal wastewater plants in Russia, Belarus, and the Baltic cities, or in the Baltic countries. Uh, it's also important to uh, work with the Western uh, neighbors. So uh, we have lots of prob- uh, projects just now running with different uh, organizations in Sweden, as well as uh, we have also been able to encourage Dan- Danish uh, organizations to really tackle the eutrophication that they know uh, very well mm-hmm. of. Um, so, but Andrea, I must say that I must admit that um, there are times that the work, uh, you know, the collaboration is easier. And then there yes. are times where the foreign policies and uh, defense policies and all that also influences, even though you are independent and your even your the neighboring organizations are independent there are just times that are easier and then times that are tough like now absolutely i mean it's unfortunately the the politics rules in 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 uh no matter where you are and no matter how you work independently or not it, it everything is influenced by that when when you look at the greater the greater picture and unfortunately uh in some of those situations the environment takes a back seat uh when when looking at the situation um that i'm sure many of the countries along the baltic sea are, are facing right now and it's it's uh it's not fun and it's and hopefully it'll be everything will be done soon as soon as possible and then you can get back to to working and in, in uh, with those countries on 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 different aspects and and be friendly again in in, in some sort of manner uh in the future so uh i hope that's that's there um you know but it's always good to talk about the culture in and around you know mm-hmm. surrounding a body of water because you, you're right it's everything is influenced by various different countries their policies uh, their focus and and you know you work with those relationships on and off yeah. and as much as you can throughout throughout history and and hopefully it'll continue to do so in the future more on than than off or more easier than than more difficult um, and that's always great now let's talk and, and, and you know let's talk about the environment because it's it's so easy for a body of water like that it, it's even though it's a small ocean it's the smallest you know part of the ocean <laughs> yes. um, in the world but it's also a very big water body, yeah, you know, and, and especially for like, we have a lot of lakes as well. So when we think of from a lake perspective, this thing's huge, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, but it, I think it's also easy to say, oh, it's big enough that it can take a lot, yeah. you know, and it can take, it can say, oh, okay. Like, you know, we can put stuff in it and it'll probably just, what, what's the, the, the saying I think engineers use the solution to pollution is dilution, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so when you put, you know, polluted water or discharge into a body of water, it'll just dilute. But there's there's a certain limit to that dilution. And it becomes, you know, what the situation that I think we're going to be talking about uh, for the rest of this podcast is eutrophication. So can you just give us um, one, I guess, to give us a little bit more context for Baltic Sea, what are the major issues, including eutrophication, that are facing uh, the Baltic Sea right now, the environmental issues. As you mentioned, Andrew, uh, eutrophication is is the uh, 
biggest problem of this uh, of this uh, shallow and um, and uh, brackish water body um, next to the eutrophication there is hazardous sub there are too many, too much hazardous substances in the water, and obviously still running into the water, meaning medical waste, meaning chemicals, meaning um, microplastics, and then uh, hypoxia, uh, the, um, and with that the debt, uh, too too large uh, debt sea bottoms in the Baltic Sea. And all of all on the top of, of all of this, there is uh, obviously the climate change that accumulates, that kind of increases uh, all of these problems. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough thing when when people when when we have so many discharges going out and and eutrophication happens. Um, now, this when when we talk about eutrophication, I almost feel more positive than negative because there's something that we can do about eutrophication as countries as po- from policy perspectives from enforcement uh, perspectives w- what is the major cause of the of eutrophication uh within say like within the baltic sea at this point uh, eutrophication is due to the too large uh, load of nutrients meaning in our case phosphorus and, and nitrogen going into the water and uh, those have been running into the water in the last, I mean, hundreds of years uh, through the, the municipal wastewaters or industrial wastewaters, uh, fertilizers, um, and di- different uh, other sources. As you said, uh, humans, or you didn't say, but uh, in a way you put it, uh, humans have been a kind of the reason for the bad state mm-hmm. of the Baltic Sea. But we also, as you say, we are also uh, the solution. Um, mm-hmm. We have been able to cut uh, a huge amount of um, phosphorus load in the last 30 years and even in the last 15 years uh, due uh, enhanced phosphorus removal uh, in our municipal wastewaters around the Baltic Sea. We have Very been nice. able to really cut down uh, the uh, nutrient load, the phosphorus load from the industrial point sources, um, which is really great. And that those two have been very cost effective too, with old, old technology, but <laughs> very effective. And then now we are tackling, so it has been, the reduction has been uh, tremendous uh, since uh, 1970s to, to, to now 2023. We still have uh, around 6,000 uh, tons of phosphorus that are going into the uh, Baltic Sea yearly that should be cut down so that we could get the Baltic Sea in a, in a good ecological state. And those tons, it's amazing uh, amount, hard to even to imagine, those tons comes from now from agriculture and forest industry. And that's mm. a little bit more difficult, uh, mm-hmm. but not impossible, as you say. We can use, uh, let, let's say, um, there is a Finnish invention, and it has been really like 40 years tested in a lab, uh, lab, uh, lab tests. And in the last 10 years, it has been used in um, agricultural fields mm-hmm. because the gypsum, when it's put on the on the agricultural field after after the harvest, uh, it binds. Uh, the phosphorus with the uh, earth particles so that it keeps it five years in the earth for the plants to be used and wow. therefore cuts down. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. It cuts down 50% immediately from the nutrient uh, runoff. So it's an amazing thing. And there's lots of gypsum. Uh, it comes from, it's actually a side effect from fertilizer in the st- industry or side effect mm-hmm. or uh, side product from uh, sugar industry or even from uh, building industry. So we have lots of sources for this gypsum and right. uh, it has this kind of a huge effect. effect. So uh, even with this problem, even though it's slower, uh, we can handle, uh, but it needs, yeah. it needs a lot of awareness raising among farmers and uh, also among administration. 
Right. Like, like from a, a government perspective, yeah. is that what you mean? And by yeah. administration? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's amazing when you, when you find, and when, when people invent or, or, uh, discover what, you know, something like this gypsum project can do. And the fact that it can reduce, you know, 50% of the phosphorus that goes in, uh, for, for those that listening, like, like phosphorus is that limiting factor in nutrient growth and, and, and plankton growth and eutrophication. So if you can control, uh, the phosphorus, you have a, you have the ability to control eutrophication or re drastically reduce eutrophication. That's what we're discovering here in the Great Lakes. Uh, uh, Lake Erie is a, is a big problem with eutrophication. We're discovering, you know, there's a lot of phosphorus in the water that's allowing those, those nutrients to, to get out of hand and, and the plankton to get out of hand and, and getting big algae blooms. So, um, that's fantastic. Now, uh, with those next steps, you know, with the, the building the relationship with the agriculture community, is that something the foundation does or, um, is it a program that you're working on to, um, you know, to build, to get, to increase those relationships, or is that done at the at the government level? We are actually so ambitious that we are doing it in a both uh, both ways. First, nice. we ob <laughs> we obviously <laughs> <laughs> have done two very big uh, gypsum uh, treatment uh, projects here around the south coast of, of Finland. Uh, it meant that we obviously had to really go from one farmer to other with the researchers who could show the effects and really uh, comfort and, and tell that there is no harm done for the earth or for the uh, for the plant production as such, so that we would still have our healthy, clean food and all that. Mm -hmm. And and then having these two big projects uh, done, and with obviously it's important to have measurements from the water in beforehand as well as after. Uh, as well as the measurements from the uh, uh, from the fields that you can really see there is uh, no harm done uh, and with that you kind of um, in kind of um, really show the impact of this kind of cost effective way to the administration so that because these are very expensive projects so that government should do this as in those areas where you can do it it's obviously not you can do it you cannot do that in areas where the water is uh, uh, in a nature reserve reservation areas, all those. Right. Um, it should be done in a large scale and that would be, we, our money would be not enough. But we have continued, <laughs> <laughs> however, how much ever. However much it costs. It's not a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously it's something also what the farmers shouldn't be paying because they are doing, of it's, it's for all of us. And, yeah. and but we have also continued to work uh, with this method uh, then also in in the other countries in the Baltic countries to test if that uh, earth is uh, of those fields are suitable. We are testing just right now in, in Sweden and Poland. And I was so happy to hear that uh, last week after returning from the summer holiday that even in Norway and Denmark, which are hardly not anymore at the Baltic Sea, that they are interested in testing this if the if the if the soil is uh, suitable for this treatment. So you need to do in different levels, and and obviously, as you mentioned earlier, you need organizations and uh, and people who who help you with that. This is, I mean, it's a big project. You know, you're talking with a, you have to you have to speak with a lot of people. You have to build that relationship and build that trust with a lot of people, because you know I think, you know, from an environmental perspective, what a lot of when when you approach from an environmental perspective, you want to do good, and I I know from my experience speaking with fishers and and farmers as well, although I have more experience speaking to fishers, they want to do good for the environment. You know, they yeah. want to do something that's good, but it's also their livelihood, so they have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Um, they've, they may have been burnt in the past. I don't know the history in Finland with the farmers, but you know, some, mm -hmm. some people have been burnt in the past in other countries. And so the trust with the government or the trust in trying something new is risky for them. It's a business for them. And they, they rely on that business. It's, um, you know, some farmers do better than others, but I know in, in case of fishing, it's, it's never a huge, like a, never a huge industry where you're going to be multi-million dollar rich. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's something that's, a part of their their culture, part of a generational sort of passing down, and and it's it's important to them. So, building that relationship and building that trust takes time. 
you yes. know, whether you're a foundation independent or you're part of the government and you, you, you have to spend the years it takes to um, speak to them. And there are a lot of farmers, you know, and, and so it's, it's, <laughs> yes. you know, there are probably associations, I assume that you can, yeah. you know, like speed that up and, and get to more, but the, you know, it is still building that relationship and, and building that trust. And that takes time. Um, unfortunately, probably time that we don't have in, in this mm-hmm. situation to, to do as, as good as possible, but it's nice when other countries are, are, you know, uh, interested and, in, and in showing their support of this and to see, if these types of, of uh, you know, their soil is is compatible with this this type of treatment. So that's always nice uh, when you get that kind of um, uh, feedback and, and that kind of interest when uh, we look when we look forward to that. So that's always that's always great to, to see. Um, now, from an interest industry perspective, you know, we look at the the. Um, we look at, at the farming, which is a big one in the, in the, the fertilizers and stuff. Are there other part, other industries that you mentioned before, when we press record, um, you have a paper industry, I guess that's pulp and paper. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a big industry. Yeah. Um, how has, is that still active in, in, in Finland, that industry in, in, in here in Canada, we had an industry. It's not as active as it used to be. Um, but is that still a, an active, um, industry in that, that, and is there any kind of relationship with them in terms of producing any kind of nutrients? It's it's very it's a very important uh, industry uh, here in Finland. It's one of our strongest. Um, basically, luckily we don't uh, rely anymore only on that uh, when right. it comes to the state's finances. Uh, but it's a big industry and uh, important industry for us. But I must say that. Uh, there are parts of Finland when even the water that goes into those uh, pulp and, and paper uh, factories, factories, uh, yeah, uh, there are parts where the uh, water that goes into the factory comes even cleaner out. So they are not. Oh, yeah, nice. they are. They have their own uh, wastewater plants, and they are very well uh, kind of. Um, there is a good surveillance on the water quality yeah. what comes out yeah. obviously and they are doing their part so they are not anymore a part of the problem they are part of the solution uh, awesome. the forest in forest industry though they are still um, the forests themselves are nowadays mm-hmm. uh, one of the problems because we have been so keen in uh, producing paper that we wanted mm-hmm. to kind of increase the uh, growth of the forests by mm-hmm. reducing the amount of water in the soil. Meaning uh, we have loads of um, now drier uh, forest with waters running into the uh, uh, Baltic Sea and obviously before that into our rivers and, and lakes. And they are running uh, obviously lots of nutrients with them. And now since the climate change is increasing the heavy rains and all that, the, the runoff is has increased like it's now nearly 20 percent of the total runoff of the for, uh, wow. phosphorus for Finland. So we have mm-hmm. now, and you can imagine what can you do in order to kind of stop that uh, runoff of water in forests themselves without dumping the growth of the wood, yeah, as, or the trees. So. Um, there we need, and there we have now started also the collaboration and, and talking and testing with that industry and with the forest owners who are nearly all of Finns own some part of mm-hmm. some forests. So that's a that's also <laughs> quite a big task. That's, uh, well, I mean that that is a big task because you you want to help the industry, but you also have to worry about runoff and and you know nutrient rich waters that are coming in yeah. that become the biggest source. Have there been, what's the coastline like? Do you have a lot of um, like coastal habitats, like salt marshes or anything like that, that um, helps filter out some of those nutrients? Yes, we do. Uh, but uh, their their help is basically, uh, we talk about some percentage. It's one, or five, one to five percent. So it's not enough. Uh, gotcha. So therefore, it's basically of, of talking of kind of uh, keeping the water in the forest lakes. Le- as long as, as possible, um, or other methods which are gotcha. yet to be discovered, must say. So that's a so that's sort of like a new problem with yeah. with 
many solutions that hopefully can be can be uh, added on to that. That's really yeah. that's really interesting. I've never heard of that, so I'm, I'm very I'm very interested to to follow that to see um, the solutions that that uh, that that come up from there and, and that that are derived from that that problem. Yeah. Um, but obviously, something that is largely contributing to to um, eutrophication, um, and so something needs to be needs to be done there. That's that's, right. that's really interesting. And you said the forest companies are very, in, or the people who own the forests are very interested uh, in finding that solution as well? They are, they are interested, obviously, uh, just not if it doesn't uh, influence uh, the size of the investment. Because in, gotcha. in Finland, we see forest as the green money. So right. <laughs> as long yeah. as the growth is not uh, kind of uh, in danger or endangered, yeah. uh, so long it's all good and everybody wants to be part of it. But if you would have to choose between clean waters and growing forests, you would always choose growing forests. Growing the forests. Yeah. yeah. And we, so interesting. Yeah, so but, interesting. And yeah. we see that it shouldn't be uh, any choosing this or that, but it should be there. We, I'm sure that, you know, there are solutions that can kind of uh keep both yeah i i mean that i think that's that's where we need to find those solutions right it's because oftentimes yeah. i I, and I see this in canada all the time uh, in north america is you know the the environmental solution is all about restriction where the business mm-hmm. side of it is like no no we want to grow or we want to maintain we don't want to restrict if we restrict that costs money and that makes it not worthwhile the investment and then so then it's not it's not a, a good solution you have to meet in the middle and, and hopefully we can find that solution in the middle for those companies are a lot of the forests in finland private yes there are a lot of private forests interesting yeah. okay Oh, okay. even big, big parts or small parts, and therefore you never you now under if you would be you would be a Finn, I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't kind of dare to talk to you about this uh, before I had asked how much forest do you own? <laughs> oh, because because you never know you that never many know. people own for. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, because you're like I don't want to make you angry. Here's yeah. some of the solutions. You may not like it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Now, does the foundation, does anybody in the foundation own forests? I'm sure my colleagues, some of my colleagues own forests and for most uh, the board of directors, I know that they own forests, but they, they that's, why, forests. Um, that's why they are kind of keen on uh, learning about the solutions because uh, obviously absolutely, one wants to have the clean west, so to say, as to say, um, yeah, themselves. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you would imagine that people who do own forests, you know, don't just own it for the product that it produces, but also the fact that you own a forest, it's, it's, you know, there's a responsibility there. That's you know, right. As it, as it still made, like it still contributes to the environmental, you know, aesthetic of, of, and, and processes of the country. Right. Absolutely. And also for some of the forest are also still important for the, uh, for the means of biodiversity, as well as obviously as production places for our oxygen, just like our oceans. Mm-hmm. And that's what I always tell people who are not interested in ocean conservation. I'm telling like, well, the Baltic Sea produces half of our oxygen. So we should be very interested in in the state and in its health. (laughs) Yeah, no, no doubt. I I think that's uh, that's fantastic. This has been... uh, amazing in terms of like finding out solutions and, you know, looking at the issues and then there's, there, you know, working with solutions and all the way through that. Um, you know, my audience is, is located around the world, you know, primarily in North America, but we have some people in Europe and, and everybody, you know, I'm sure a lot of us that are listening as, as I am are very interested in finding out what, what can people do, you know, that are like, what can the audience members do to help in, in any kind of way, uh, you know, to the restoration and, and vital, revitalization of the Baltic Sea? Well, just like your your audience, the, as you know, and your audience knows, uh, we are on a blue planet. Basically, we li- live in an archipelago of this blue planet. So all the waters mm-hmm. do turn around. So whatever good you are doing on your ocean and your water body of its river or lake, it also helps us. But uh, And foremost... As, as I always say, if somebody asks, what can I do? It's also mm-hmm. a question of, of your plate, of the food you eat. The more mm. vegetables and uh, sustainably fished fish you eat and less meat, 
the better mm-hmm. uh, is that the better it is also for the Baltic Sea of, or for any oceans because the climate change or the climate crisis, the, the work against the climate crisis and the work for ocean conservation mm-hmm. goes there hand in hand. And obviously, the big scale projects are done uh, by organizations like us. So donations mm-hmm. do good in that yep. sense. Perfect. Well, thank you, Anna Marie. This has been uh, such a pleasure to have you on the podcast <laughs> and, and learn a lot about the Baltic Sea and Finland. Uh, I know we're just scratching the surface, so I'd love to invite you back on or members from the foundation back on to discuss more of these projects in depth and and be able to uh, you know spread some of the great projects that are going around and obviously you know love to hear those future solutions uh, for for getting those nutrients out of this forest or, or keeping them in there as much as possible. I think it's uh, it's really important. So thank you so much for for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate it. And again, we'd love to have you back on. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much for inviting. And it was has been a great pleasure. And also, <laughs> it's great just that there are podcasts like yours uh, to kind of keep us in, in thinking of the blue. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's something that I, it's a great privilege to be able to do this. So it, it, and it's a lot of fun. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Anna Marie, for joining us on the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. It was great to have you on. Uh, It was great to hear about the Baltic Sea. It was great to hear about how the eutrophication issue is being met head on and how farmers, foresters, uh, and and the pulp and paper mill industry is working towards reducing the amount of nitrogen and the amount of phosphorus that is entering the Baltic Sea. This is something that's really important. Even though solutions aren't always there right ahead of you, the fact that you start a dialogue with stakeholders, the fact that you are working towards a common solution that is benefited, that is going to benefit both the stakeholder as well as the environment, are really important aspects to conservation. It's really important aspects to maintain you know the vitality of a sea as even though it's small even though it's young the baltic sea provides a lot of benefit to um you know the country the countries that have coastlines along the the baltic sea and so that's something that i feel is really important to look ahead and to be able to work with people in a in a very um positive manner in a very productive manner i think that's really important so uh very happy to have anna marie on the podcast to be able to talk about that i'm going to put links uh to their socials links to their website in the show notes. So check that out. If you don't know what your show notes are, if you're new to podcasting, not a worry. We love new podcast, new podcast listeners. All you have to do is whatever app you're listening to this on, you just have to go to the description in there and that's the show notes. And you just have to click on the links to get access to their website, to get access to their socials um, and be able to learn more about them. Some of them might be in English. Some of them might be their websites in English uh, and some of them might, the socials might be in Finnish, but that's okay. It's it's always good to just kind of get a characteristic around uh, what, they're doing and it was really great to have Anna Marie on um, and be able to have uh, some people that that I've never met before I always love that so if you have a conservation story that you'd like to tell or you're working with an organization or you're working on something on your own that you want to share with the audience feel free to book a time to interview just put a description when you book that time there's a place to do that Uh, and of course uh, links to your websites and social so I can get more of a background we'll have that conversation about having you on I'd love to hear more people with their conservation stories. So uh, we've been very fortunate to have a lot of people on over the summer. I'd like to continue that in the fall. So if you know of anybody or you think you should be on and tell your story, your conservation story, even if you're not in the industry or you're not in the field and you want to be able to be a part of this and you want to share your struggles, your successes of you know just doing individual things or maybe you work with government or uh, work with your MP or, or your government representative, at whatever level, I would love to hear that story. I would love to share that story with the audience. I think it's really important that we share our story. So feel free, there's a Calendly link in the show notes. So in the description, you can just click on that and you'll be able to uh, see that and book a time, okay? So thank you very much to Anna Marie for joining us. Thank you to the John Nermanen Foundation for being able to uh, facilitate this, really appreciate this. They reached out through the Calendly link as well and um, it's always great to be able to meet new people that way. Always love that. Uh, but yeah, if you want to uh, if you want to share this episode with somebody that you think will benefit, feel free to do that. That's free. That's easy to do. That's always wonderful. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. I'm your host, Angelo, and have a great day. We'll talk to you next time, and happy conservation. Happy conservation.